Well, welcome this afternoon for everybody that stayed. Everybody showed up uh, uh, for today as well. We had a really good run through uh, through the center here. I'm uh, uh, obviously the wildfire situation in the West year after year it just seems to be getting even more challenging. I, uh, I pointed out they pointed out for me the 430,000 acre fire in my own district, and we're all us Westerners are all suffering it one way or the other. So. Anyway, our panelists are Tiffany Taylor of the United Aerial Firefighters Association, Wakely Blaine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Clara Nilsson and Jess Willis are with the National Wildfire Suppression Association. Okay. Shannon Horn, Perimeter Solutions. Uh, Tyson Bertone Riggs, co author of the Wildland Fire and Mitigation Commission Report. Uh, Caitlin Glover, Public Lands Council. Wait, bigger. <laughs> and uh, Brian Schofield with the National Mobile Shower and Catering Association. That's right. Okay, appreciate you all being here. And uh, we're, uh, in order for economy of time and not having uh, members of Congress maybe expound as we tend to do sometimes, we're going to just launch right into the, the questions here. So they've uh, given me a few to uh, work over, but we'll invite questions from my colleagues as well, Michelle Fishbach, and of course our hometown man, Mike Simpson. So, um, this Congress, uh, I introduced the bill to increase the use of grazing to reduce fire fuels, which makes fires burn hotter, faster, you know, the really fine stuff, and more dangerous. This is really important across many types of fire prone areas, from forested landscapes to sagebrush stuff like here in the Boise area. In your view, panelists, what else can Congress or the administration do to be proactive and reduce fire risk? Who wants to jump in on that? I'm happy to take the first one. So speaking from the perspective of the Wildland Fire Mitigation and Management Commission, the report does lay out a number of recommendations. Uh, I think there's been a little bit of criticism that there may be too many of them, but I think you really can boil it down to a handful of areas of action that we need to see from Congress, one of which is mitigation on the front end. So I appreciate the, the work on that. Uh, some of it is mitigation in the natural environment. Uh, for those that were on the field tours yesterday, I think we, we started to veer towards that conversation about forest management uh, and about wildfire. I think you're all familiar with some of those things. But important to point out, we also need to be doing mitigation work in the built environment and in communities as well. And maybe just to, to add on that as well, I mean, I think you have <clears throat> you have three stages, right? Um, without spending a lot of time talking about how we got here, uh, I think there tends to be um, sometimes a, an, an insistence that we return to way lands were managed before in order to fix the problem that we have now. But we have more wooies. We have more complex challenges now. So I think really being creative. Um, for us, it's in the grazing space, in the livestock space, we have two I think distinct problems and that's where Congress and, and the agencies um, really both need to act in concert. Um, first, Congress is now dealing with an entirely new universe where Chevron doctrine is not going to be helpful in the wildfire space. So for all of you uh, who are writing bills, who are helping your bosses to write bills, being very, very specific about which authorities to use and where and under what conditions is absolutely paramount. Things like incorporating grazing in a more uh, in a more meaningful way, prescribed fire in a more meaningful way under certain conditions. Uh, Mr. LaMalfa, your, your bill is absolutely key to knock down some of the biggest risk, and it's that knock-on effect into how agencies plan NEPA into the future that's critical. Agencies need to use the tools at their disposal, but also need to work with Congress to build a better NEPA so that we're not looking at conditions as they are now, but examining options of what management tools will be needed and should be examined when, not if, fire happens on the landscape. Thank you. You, you kind of uh, launched into the second question. I appreciate that on, uh, on the grazing aspect, because a lot of the conversation is on suppression and response. How do we get ahead of the curve? And, uh, Caitlin outlined how grazing can and really should be an important part of that. So part of the legislation we're talking about allows for uh, uh, more, not only more grazing, but in a stopgap measure, if good grazing land has been destroyed because of another fire or some type of a disaster situation, we would streamline the process where that people with grazing rights can transfer those on at least a temporary basis to another area that can and needs to be grazed. So it helps the rancher but it also helps with what we're trying to do here with the 
suppression of those fuels and, and well, the elimination of those fuels and the constant uh, need to maintain. You know, we, we talked, of, you mentioned on the intervention by people versus a natural approach. Well, nature, <coughs> nature isn't, does it in a hopscotch way. It, it, it isn't, you know, whereas for people, we, we would have to, we would try to do a little more, uh, a little more organized long term if we had all the tools and the permission, so. The fire that happens in the sagebrush complex um, is, is very, very different than fire that happens in tall trees. Um, but the, the, the consequence or how we got here is the same. 50 years ago, there was more than double the grazing presence on the landscape. You had more fine fuel removal, you had more you had more cows, you had more sheep, you had more animals to remove that fuel um, in, a, in a really meaningful way. There's been a consolidation of use of allotments, there's been a, a consolidation of that grazing um, through the tightening of regulations. And so while yesterday we were talking about grazing being really important as a, as a national security, a food security component, one of the things that Congress, I, I think, has to do and the agencies have to do is transition into thinking about grazing as a land management tool. Putting grazing as a frontline option when you're looking at fine fuels removal as you would with prescribed fire, with mowing, with other tools. In, quickly, in a bear scenario, the, the same. Can touch on what's going on with the conservation groups? Oh, yeah. Buying, buying up the, I, a lot of people don't know that. <clears throat> yeah, so, so in, in, the, in this consolidation of allotments, one of the things that, that I think is, is the biggest threat is that there has been a move over time to um, in in a sort of backdoor third party approach um, remove grazing from allotments by uh, by having a, a voluntary relinquishment of a grazing permit a permittee would relinquish a permit for a variety of reasons but then the agency never reissue it reissues those permits on those allotments. Those allotments stand vacant. They have been managed contiguously with grazing and, and you know, very I think, thoughtful application over a number of years. So when you have that hard stop, it changes the environment. Um, it makes it more fire prone. It makes it more less uh, biodiverse, right? Um, and so you have this fairly irreparable um, management scenario change that, that, you know, you never reissued those permits. Um, reissuing permits is, is a huge part of it, and it, but it has to be done alongside um, some of these other creative targeted grazing in, in most fire prone environments. Um, the kind of environments where, you know, these folks aren't dropping suppressant on big grazing allotments because the, the grazing allotments aren't the ones that are burning the hottest, the fastest, the, the most, you know, in the most damaging way. It's all along those fringe areas. Um, I mean, I think Tyson said it best, right? You know, use all of those tools. And for us, grazing hasn't been part of that top level frontline tool conversation. But as we're looking at, you know, all of the acres that have burned this year and, and also the repeat burns, grazing has to be at, at that top, you know, in, in that top tier of, of consideration. You know, especially with environmental groups now trying to seek to buy up those rights and just mm -hmm. not use them. It's a green city. It's, uh, Claren and Jess, oh, we've seen uh, maybe less, a little less fire in some places in the West. We have some that are burning with greater intensity and a lot more acreage, for example. You know, the number of fires they were talking this morning about how they could knock out 98% of them when they're small was the 2% that uh, really causes uh, the headlines. So. So they're burning with an intensity, moving across landscapes really at a lightning pace sometimes. Uh, what, what's your association doing to keep up with these stronger fires? How can Congress be a help to you and how can you be part of that equation? The private sector within the, the fire suppression community makes up around 17,000 firefighters or 17,000 pieces of equipment, a solid 10,000 firefighters. And we're here to supplement and help the agency uh, when when their staffing levels can't meet the demand and so we, you know and, and and our same resources are working on fuels projects prescribed burn projects we're helping the mitigation side of of our current situation on all the local levels you know the majority of our members are small business owners a lot of them are, are ranchers our loggers our folks in your rural communities uh, by a whole and uh, you know we help the government fight fire uh, seasonally um, or all year depending on where we're at now um, and I think 
What, what we need help from, and we've had great communication uh, this last year with, with the agency, but we need contracts that um, support providing quality resources that have some predictability in, in, the, in the future. Um, because private industry is those, for those of you, you know this, that we, we, we innovate with technology, we're innovating uh, techniques, we're innovating products, and without a, a dependable contracts, we can't invest in those those new new areas of innovation and improve what we're doing. So you know we're asking for support in in, in working on some language with UEFA and trying to get these contracts so it it puts call quality folks out there uh, on the ground to provide quality resources to help put these fires out faster and and get away from a lowest price technically acceptable approach in contracting yeah current contracting hasn't uh, really adequately uh, given you the ability to hire and retain the experienced people you want i've heard some you, you folks have talked to me in the past uh, meetings about how really qualified people are somehow ineligible to to uh, be part of this so um, well and congressman um yeah. as as the, the private wildland fire service expands, if we had a true public par private partnership with the federal government, we have the ability to give all of these resources, all of the technology and innovation, but also be able to, to utilize all of the people that are within our staffs, but also cross train with the federal government. They have treks. We're, we're burning logging slash on steep slopes. That's something that the federal government hasn't done in a long time. Having that ability to help cross train without litigation or, or the liability because someone that, that I'm training uh, twists an ankle or whatever. The skill sets that the private sector can bring to the agencies, the the new technology, the cut to length equipment, all of those things that, that we have, we can help them as they learn to understand the different capabilities and skill sets that the private sector brings to bear. Bill, Bill can I just ask, what, oh, yeah, Michelle, please. what do you see that relationship looking like? I mean, talking about the partnership, and I guess I'm just wondering, if you could expand a little bit more on that, what you, what you envision it as. Yes, ma'am. So Chief Moore has been very gracious. Um, the fire staff here um, has been very helpful. They let us meet. But just think, if we had the ability to set up incident command posts outside of fire season, be able to do high hazard fuels treatments, be able to run equipment, bring in grazing, the, the, the whole scale, having that ability to, to no longer be us and you, um, to have that partnership, to be able to learn from each other and, and not compete, but truly cooperate. That's what we're looking for. Having that ability that, that we can understand certain things that, that the federal government has their hands tied over in contracting. But with new language that, that Tiffany's working on, that Tyson's been working on, having that ability to, to, to cross that chasm, that's what we need to do because there are people out there and they're all in communities at risk. Having those people that are within the private wildland fire service that can cross train with federal agencies, that, that helps meet the mission far quicker simply because we're no longer um, the contractor, but we're actually cooperators. Thank you. <clears throat> if I could just briefly to add on to that. So I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that there are in fact two commission reports, one of which is focused specifically on aviation. Uh, that came out in January of last year. And in the course of those conversations, the commission did notice 
that the contract community, which in this aviation space in particular is really where most of the uh, airplanes, aircraft that are being used are coming from, that, that unfortunately we do have sort of a hands-off, arm's length relationship between federal agencies and the contracting partners. There is a need to work closer with contractors so that the agencies can better understand the needs. And, you know, I might actually just add on to this as well that, you know, my, um, I come from a military background and we allow the military folks to train with other countries because we know at some point they're going to be, you know, in fighting with them. We allow them to train all year round for a fire that, or sorry, for a war that we hope they will never have to fight. But we don't do the same thing with our firefighters, both private and public for fires that we know are gonna happen. So it just seems a little crazy how much money and effort we put into trying to get people ready for something we don't want to ever happen and we don't do the same thing for um, the people that are protecting our homes, protecting our lives. You know, that's what the military does as well. We just need to consider the firefighters to be just like the military in that sense. All right, let me shift it a little bit here on the uh, fire retardant. Now, you would think that would be just a common sense, regular regular part of what we should be doing, but we had, there was actually a lawsuit about a year and a half ago to try and eliminate fire retardants. And it took almost a, a miracle just to keep that around as the courts looked into it and said, no, we need to have a, at least let it remain as a stopgap until some uh, more science comes in on what its uh, possible effects and its usage are. So we have to keep it around for a while longer, hopefully much longer, as we find that it's a fairly inert uh, material. So let me show this to Shannon here. Um, of course, it's necessary, vital tool, and um, the environmental act activists have tried to reduce and eliminate the, the retard because of, they say, to species and water quality. Now, I know that they're very diligent in keeping it out of water areas with their uh, their zones. I'll let you I'll let you elaborate on that. But uh, so, what what can we uh, what can we hear from you on perimeters uh, material and how effective is the safety record it's had in the, in the fighting wildfire? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's it's really it's about education, continued education on this. Um, you know, to <clears throat> to these groups and the people out there. Uh, you know, it's, we provide, you know, obviously we're dedicated to provide the most safest and efficient products uh, available in the world. Um, you know, they're phosphate based. It's a uh, product made by Simplot partially um, and um, it's fertilizer based. Mm -hmm. Roughly one tenth of 1% of the uh, fire retardant dropped in our lands is the impact. So it's, it's very- What do you mean by that? Uh, and fertilizer based mm -hmm. and so your farm all the fertilizer that's uh, utilized in the country fire retardant impact is about one tenth of one percent okay so yeah um, you know the Fox check brand products have been around for over 60 years the Forest Service has you know a very stringent testing protocol um, you know that takes up to years sometimes to uh, get products approved and so you know they're they're proven to work, and uh, as we see, and especially the you know the challenging times, you see the urban interface that is is being affected so so harshly in California right now. Um, but they've proven to you know save lives, property, and uh, our ecosystem. So it's a very valuable tool, um, and it's, it really comes down to continued education. Uh, let's follow up on the uh, lawsuit itself. What are you hearing on that, and uh, the timeliness from? The current administration, or maybe it morphs into the next one on the on the permit 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 permit. What do you hear on the lawsuit? What do you hear on a, a permit to update? Uh, I don't really have a good update on that. I think it's it's one of these things that takes time. I think the agencies are doing what they can do to you know meet the needs and the requirements that are uh, been specified set forth. So um, again, it's it's uh, it's going to take a little time, but I think it's it's nothing that's going to uh, really change the overall impact of the tool that's out there right now. Okay, so we got to keep it last year and this year. You, you feel like we're safe next year? Your best guess? My best guess is yes. Yeah. You know, 60 years you've been using retardant it's it's a like we said you know for our people out there on the ground that really need it most and these tight areas we have fires that are just so intense now um, you, know, you 
can't predict what they're doing. So yes, it's, it's a very important to keep. You must have too many people drinking the retardant or something. Right? <laughs> uh, Tiffany, on, our aerial firefighters play an important role in protecting uh, what we, we love and care about from being destroyed by wildfire. It's a dangerous job, requires great skill, and uh, also load the materials uh, in, a, in a way that uh, is going to suppress the fire. So can you elaborate on the challenges that the aerial firefighting industry faces? How could Congress assist? And then on the, on the positives of the new technologies that are making more broader ways of fighting the fire. So Tiffany, please. Well, the industry is, you know, really up to the challenge of, you know, making sure that we're able to, to, to protect everyone's uh, homes, protect the fire, the ground firefighters, you know, that's really what we're there for. But the challenges that we have is that there is a worldwide demand for these aircraft, um, for these pilots, and the methods of contracting, which as was said earlier, you know, almost all of the aircraft um, are private industry and contracted. They, um, the way funding is apportioned, the way that the contracts are written, the way that decisions are being made of when sh aircraft should be made available, those uh, decisions are impacting industry's ability to actually sustain itself. Because when there are, I guess, good years or lean years, it's. It, you know, whenever there aren't as many fires and there's still an aircraft um, bill, you know, loan to pay off, there's still uh, employees that you have to pay because you don't want them to go to another country or, or someplace else to get that job, you want to be able to retain them. Yeah. There is no cash flow coming in. And that lack of cash flow, at some point, the banks say, I, I'm not going to give you any more money. So, you know, to have a contract that doesn't necessarily cost more to the government, and I've done some analysis, but to have a contract that is um, a steady guarantee of multiple years allows the companies to be able to invest in their equipment, to plan for the future for the technology that is coming out, um, and to retain those experienced pilots and mechanics and so I'm you know encouraged by some opportunities you know with my contracting background I have some ideas on how we might be able to to fix this issue and to again just to give that stability to the industry and allow more um, more opportunities for the aircraft to be available year-round and I'm not saying that that means we need all of the aircraft um, you know available all year round but if you look at what happened in Texas it took so long for us to get aircraft to Texas because there weren't any aircraft that were standing by ready to go all of the aircraft were in maintenance or they were in other countries because that was just the way the contracts were written and industry had to go and you know, do what they needed to do. So, well, you, you stood on both sides of that fence there. Yes. In your experience. Uh, yes, That's I have. I was here. So, uh, um, and we need your ideas on how we can prod the agencies to be more efficient or timely and think a little more broadly on that because, you know, we've experienced as members of Congress in our districts where we keep hearing about these problems is that whether it's aerial equipment or even ground equipment, that uh, Forest Service isn't ready to, uh, you know, I don't know what they're doing in the off season, but to what, what do you think we can really do to improve? Do you see, do you see the attitude actually improving? Because, you know, a couple of years ago, we made a fuss about it and they patched it up for that year. And then we had a good year. Then it's like they forgot about it the following. So being, having a lot of years in the, in the government and understanding all of the challenges that are there, it is really hard to find time to make those updates to sit down with industry to do the things that need to be done because there are so many things that need to be done but if, if we're able to prioritize that collaboration because in the end that collaboration is going to give us more time more effective <coughs> response um, better contracts because we won't be dealing with the 
back and forth of what we always call throwing it over the fence um, to get the response. We won't be dealing with contract protests as much because we will actually be, industry will be partners with government in order to have it, um, you know, have the requirements written so that the industry can actually provide something that is available and not 20 years antiquated. And so, you know, we're looking forward to working with the um, agencies now and you know, drafting, especially now that we have the association for Ariel, you know, this is the first time we've had it. And, you know, the ability for us to provide market research for information about what's coming in the future and giving that to the agency that, so that they don't have to go and try to find it themselves, which is what, you know, is half the battle, right? Having the information in your hands. So I'm very hopeful that we're going to be able to, to move forward yeah, with that. Yeah, use that word collaboration. I think industry's fired up, ready to go. Yeah. But the people in the big stone buildings, uh, a lot of times the door feels like it's locked and uh, they don't answer the phone. So um, I guess that's where you need to advise us on how uh, we can get those doors cracked open a little better and have them listen a little better, correct? Well, yes. I mean, I, I hate the idea of us having to force the agencies to do it, but having been on the agency side, I know sometimes that's how you get things up to the top of the list because your leadership is focused on what's at the top of the list and if a congressman calls that automatically goes to the top of the list whether people like it or not yeah <laughs> and it would, you wish it was all in an order instead of like the hopscotch of this congress and that congress <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so uh, okay let's uh let's throw this over to uh to brian here on uh, on the vendors there with uh, so ensuring that victims of natural disasters have food and sanitation available after crisis is an often overlooked aspect of wildfire response and certainly those of us with many many people have been displaced by fire we see it firsthand and we get those phone calls so brian can you give a brief lay of the land of your current operations that are impacted by intense fire in california idaho and oregon as well that we're we're contracted by the forest service so we generally don't get into supporting um, evacuees or or in displaced uh, the last time I think we did as a, as a group was Katrina. Um, and that was, uh, a lot of us got sent down there. I went down in, in, a, in a different capacity, but, um, uh, you know, our primary function is to be part of the support of the incident base camp, providing meals and, sh and then we also, our showers um, uh, for the incident base camps. And that's, that's, primary, that's our primary function. Uh, on on a fire, yeah, yeah. I'm sure many members have visited those and and see that they're quite an operation there. They really crank out the meals in a speedy fashion and have a, it's an impressive setup. So um, we've uh, we've had uh, issues pop up with quality of food in some of these situations. And what what can you say about uh, well about that that we can uh, you know drill down on a little bit better so that we have firefighters. They're burning a lot of calories out there, and I, you know, I've had been given one of those lunch packs. There's a lot of stuff to eat in there for when they're out on the line, and uh, I, I can't even eat it all. <laughs> That's me, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, but they need that. But when they're back at the camp, there, you know, and I'm not pointing at you, but we've, we've had instances where stuff hadn't been so good, you know. And so, can you comment on how that overall picture was? Yeah, keep in mind that we are an association of 30 independent companies. So, um, we all have our, our standards. Uh, you know, I mean, as the president, I, you know, I get calls from uh, all, all different uh, parts of the fire, you know, complaining about, uh, you know, meals at a, at a camp and I, I tell them that you know it's really you, you have to talk to the team uh, there's nothing I can do I, I, I own my company and I'll be happy to talk about anything in my company but I really can't address that um, I can talk to the owner and but um, but also understand that we have a very specific contract and this is the thing that I, I, I think even I think a lot of the members of the team understand, but there's a lot that really don't. In fact, I know they don't. Uh, and, you know, we have actually been told by our contracting officer that you can't, you can't go right or left of that contract. That is what you have to do. 
And you know, we all know everybody in this room has an opinion on food. And you know, and I tell my people, they'll say, God, that, that fireman says the best meal he's ever had. And I said, don't pay attention to him because the guy right after him is gonna say, it's the worst meal I've ever had. So all we can do is our best and, and source the best meals. And I can tell you when you get into this situation that we're in now, PL5, resources and, and supplies for us is difficult. It's very difficult. And we, but we still have a very specific contract. So it, it, it makes, and when I say that, you know, we show up and in four hours set up a restaurant and feed 2,000 people, um, that's, that's, a, that's pretty tough to do. And, you know, so we, all, all I tell my people is just do everything in your power to fulfill the contract and meet the contract. And, and unfortunately, when you have a contract like that, not everybody that's partaking in that knows the contract. They don't understand that we can't, you know, serve crab salad on the salad bar uh, and then shrimp salad and all the different things that they may want. We, you know, we can do uh, within the scope, but we can't have this big buffet or you know, things that we used to. We used to do do things a little differently, but now it's it's really much more tightened up. So, um, so Brian, can I add to, yes. to that because I think that there's something that a lot of people don't realize about the contracts either is that. Um, the vendors are required to bid on these contracts, um, you know, for five years. And a lot of these contracts, guess when they got bid? 2018, 2019. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. And unfortunately, the way the contracts are written, there is no ability for them to get an economic price adjustment for the increase in cost of labor, for um, insurance, for food, for the caterers. And so they're having to work with these prices that frankly are horrible and they're leaving very little room for any margins. And especially because of the, the lean years, you know, over the past few years. So the, the ability of a, for um, the agencies to adjust those contracts that's something else that i'm working on that i'm hoping that we can fix this problem and then any of the new contracts that get awarded that they will automatically have economic price adjustments for situations where you know it's beyond the control of the business owner it's not because they failed in you know estimating what their cost would be right it's because something extraordinary has happened or because you know, certain states there are higher costs than others. So, yeah. Tiffany and Brian, is there? Yeah, you know, I'm glad you're underlining that because you know we wouldn't necessarily know or think about that. Well, is there ability within the agency or within the contract as written to do have that flexibility for, or, or do we need to? Yeah, there, there has, the way the, yeah the way the contracts are written, which they're, they're legal documents, right? Yep. And it's not because the agency doesn't want to do this; it's because they have no authority to do it. And so that's where we need Congress to help to give them the authority to fix these existing contracts right now. And then again, for the future contracts, they can put language in them so that this won't happen again. But really, right now is when everybody is struggling to try to catch up with all of those COVID. It, it, and it's not just gain. No, right, right, it's, right. No, it's, it's, all, it's, it's all of us. And yes. If, can I give a, a, sure, a, sure. a short little story? Um, this year, the first fire we went out on was the Vista fire down in San Bernardino. We're, we're based in Santa Maria. Um, the first order that we had sent out um, had liquid eggs. Okay, we get them in a 40 pound box. 40 pound box will feed about 100 people. Uh, I think we were at about 800 when our initial uh, meals were were uh, ordered. Uh, so that's eight cases of liquid eggs, roughly. I mean, you know, we always have backup, but that's that's what we start out with. <laughs> Pre-COVID, we were paying about 35 to 40 dollars for that case of eggs. When they arrived on the fire this year, they were 169 dollars for one case. That's what we're dealing with. And uh, the other thing that we're dealing with, and this has nothing to do with the government, but the vendors that we're dealing with during COVID raised all their prices. And I, I, again, this is probably not unique to us, but they raised all their prices. Then as pricing has come down, they haven't come down. So they're, 
uh, you know, holding on to a lot more. I've always said that the vendors, a lot of the vendors that we deal with kind of have the license to steal. You know, they, they, uh, we agree on something and that's why and I negotiate. There's so much competition that you can go to outside. No, that's the specialized. problem. That's the problem with, with our industry. We've basically got three broadline vendors, Cisco, U.S. Foods, and Shamrock that can cover the Western U.S. Um, you know, right now we're, they're out of tra trailers uh, because we get our food in trailer drops because it's so much that they just drop the trailer and take the empty one. And uh, so, yeah, it, it gets difficult, but all of that affects us and the ability to, to perform really. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Tyson, in the, in the legislation that there was a infrastructure is directed at the completion of reports <coughs> on need policies to help mitigate and suppress wildfires were to be done. So as a co-author of the Wildlife Fire Mitigation Management Report, do you have any thoughts on letting our native tribes take more of a lead on some of the fire mitigation efforts to get around some of the limitations that other groups may have, if you know what I mean. So. Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, on the commission, we had a number of enrolled tribal members. Uh, we really had a robust conversation about ways that tribes can uh, further play within suppression, but also co-stewardship, co-management, and management of tribal lands. <clears throat> Ultimately, we ended up with a, a full work group that focused on the issue of uh, what we term tribal sovereignty, how tribes can better engage here. This is certainly a space that Congress can do a lot. Uh, many of the authorities that allow federal agencies to uh, cooperate with tribes through co-management are fundamentally products of Congress. Uh, they vary agency to agency. Uh, the Commission certainly saw space for improvements on co-management authorities for the Forest Service in particular. Uh, but the other piece of this is resourcing. Uh, tri many tribes would like to play a, a greater role in this, uh, but it does require some financial support in order to build out crews to be able to do some of this co-management. Uh, so again, I think there's a there's a role for Congress to help in that. Talk a little well. about the Good Neighbor Act as well previous farm bill and the improvements we're doing on this one if, you're, if you can. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And and I'll say I, I actually had the privilege of working with the first Good Neighbor program in the state of Oregon, uh, so I have seen Good Neighbor on the ground. For those who are unfamiliar with it, uh, this is an authority that allows federal agencies to partner with uh, states, tribes, and counties uh, to have those entities do work on the ground. And I think we've seen a lot of success with that through a number of different western states. Um, there is a component of this, though, that uh, I think just through accident, not intention, uh, Congress allowed states to manage the revenue that can come from projects from timber sales, uh, but they didn't extend that to tribes and counties. And the commission did talk about the need for this to be extended to tribes. Uh, my understanding is that's been a discussion within farm bills, so I, I think folks were hopeful to see that fix happen, uh, but yeah, that was yeah. part of the, the right. That's, farm bill does have that aspect in it that we've been working on, as well as uh, more categorical exclusions to increase the acreage size, and uh, as well as uh, wider wider uh, path around power lines you know I, I don't know why we're doing this in 2024 when the power line has been around for 100 years but that said we have to fight back against the creep of bureaucracy and, and litigation and long time permit process to be able to clear out power lines so all the above and so you know please be fans of the farm bill we're, we're, we need that uh, important forestry aspect of what we're talking about here but so many other things that the farm bill as we're trying to move the thing it's not more and more the discussion is going to be during the lame duck part of this uh, this year, but you know, farm bill started off in a really positive foot, strong bipartisan effort, or or uh, conversations around the country, with different field periods and such, and then it got balled up in politics and a CBO score we waited all summer for. So there's very important things for forestry in that farm bill as USDA oversees U.S. Forest Service, and that's why I asked to be chair of the subcommittee on forestry. And, and keep moving the ball on this stuff, so, so thank and you. If Congress could allow the private sector to be part of that cooperative agreement, we have the ability to hire as well. And after all, it is all hands, all lands, correct? You're right. It's a, that becomes a tougher political question, like, oh, you're going to just seed it, you know, it all over to big timber, right? That's what you're going to hear on the other, not, not me, but you know. But we need those partnerships. We need to support the industry much better than what we're doing. We, uh, we had a field hearing in, uh, I think it was March, back in South Dakota for with the Nyman Lumber Company. The Forest Service needs to be getting the material 
out available to them. They needed X amount of board feet, and they were like at about 8% of what they needed at that point. And I don't know what they did this year, but that uh, company has to lay off, I think, about a third of its workforce with the slowness of Forest Service to get that acreage out. And so if we're not going to keep these sawmills in business, who the heck is going to help us process and do the work out there? There's not enough money in the Treasury for this all to be privately done. As I mentioned in yesterday's comments, why the heck are we the number one importer of wood products in this country as we burn you know, millions of acres? So, um, uh, any, anybody else on the panel like to weigh in on that? You, you did, but on the uh, on the management report there, we're gonna we're gonna gear down here pretty quick. So, uh, let me. I, I want to get one back more for uh, uh, for uh, Jess and Claren uh, initially the, on the uh, uh, your members are indeed they're small businesses, and the de decisions made by the agencies impact your ability to operate. So what would you like to see change? We had a little chat about how some of the contracting from one state to the other, I don't know how much you want to touch on that, but uh, what, what do you think about uh, what do you think about that aspect of how, uh, how the agencies are? I think right that we have two folks overseeing, and, there, and there's some uh, inspectors, there's a handful of inspectors in there, but in terms of the scale of, of our program and, and the volume and the cost associated with that, we have very very little oversight and then so what's happening is is not every business owner runs their business the same way and and i, I believe there's quality issues i think there's efficiency issues um which that that rolls into you know our costs um and so i think one of the big things that our in our association would like to see is giving the agency the power to have that oversight to make sure these contracts are quality best value contracts, do away with LPTA, the lowest price technically acceptable, mm -hmm. and add some meat to performance, add meat to being in business and, and having a proven track record. And, and, and that allows the professionals that do this, that are consistently supporting the agency, the ability to continue to improve, employ, work hand in hand, and make sure the incident management teams have the quality resources they want to see. Um, and so I, I think that, from my view, that's that's the, the top. I don't, Claire, do you? I think I'd also like to see the, the contract actually talk to operations. And, and actually get what they need instead of get what they get. You, you have crews, equipment, the 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 whole gamut but when when operations chiefs make that request for feller bunchers or hot saws or whatever that may be the people that they're trying to that are trying to order it have absolutely no clue what it is and so giving those individuals if that ops chief wants something and he knows exactly where it is or that division supervisor and she knows exactly where it is and what it does and what she needs let those people make those requests get the work on the job on the ground that you know if you know what it is why why do you have to get what a contracting officer gives you because it fits into a box especially with all of the new innovative equipment that's out there. There's a lot of stuff. And the federal government's not in the logging business anymore. The private sector is. And they know how to move equipment and they know how to source it and move that material much faster than the federal government. Absolutely. If we don't have them, we're going to be worse shape than we are. As the Forest Service plan seemed to be about 1% per year of acreage treated and I don't think we're going to count uh, uh, a moonscape landscape as, uh, as treated are we so um, uh, Shannon had to run to the airport so we appreciate uh, it, uh, his input on uh, retardant etc so with that I'm, uh, I'm supposed to wrap this up I, I, I love doing this and I'd love to go longer and I, I, is there any 
I, anything that anybody's dying to say on this panel that needs to get out. So, okay. I, I would love to actually, just okay. one or, thing. Or be quick. It's, or, it's a complex problem. It has a lot of different facets. We've heard a lot about the response and the contracting piece of it. But I would urge you also to look to the reports of the commission as a resource as you craft legislation and think not just about mitigation on the front end and response, but also post fire recovery. Think about workforce, think about the role that the federal agencies play. There's a lot of work to be done here. There's no one silver bullet, but we think there's silver buckshot. <laughs> silver buckshot. Especially with uh, the, the condor situation, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd love, th th this question would mostly be for Tyson. Um, uh, first, I just want to say, you know, the commission report has been an absolutely essential resource for me in my year and a half of reporting on wildfires. So thank you to you and all your colleagues. Uh, your your fellow co-author, uh, Kamiba Barrett, has been making a lot of noise with others about the relatively short shrift that the built environment gets when we're trying to resolve this problem. I think it's fairly safe to say that the reason that many agencies remain in a suppression first uh, footing, even though there's widespread acknowledgement that, that this has been a quite problematic stance, is precisely because of threats to the built environment. Um, the report uh, makes many uh, recommendations about strict building codes, uh, zoning uh, regulations that would prohibit the building in certain areas. Uh, these are obviously extraordinarily fraught and vexing uh, questions for the American West where many people see their ability to build where and how they want as an essential component of freedom in the West. At the same time, then building in those places means that my friends and colleagues have to go out and do the very dangerous suppression work more often than I think many would agree is, is, is wise. I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts, and certainly we have a lot of powerful people in this room, about ways to approach this extraordinarily complicated and politically compl complex uh, issue of, of changing the way that we live and build in the wildlands. You're going to have to do it really quickly to that complex question. So yes, the extremely short answer is the commission recommended uh, greater coordination between existing federal agencies and federal programs to create a community wildfire risk reduction program. They were careful to say that these need to be incentive-based programs, recognizing that different jurisdictions will have different needs when it comes to building and building codes. But federal agencies can play an important role in incentivizing some of these changes, and they can play an important role in providing some of the funding for things like home hardening for communities planning, uh, as well as some of the science and technology uh, that will help communities make these decisions. Thank you. 